And guess what? The rankings are almost identical. That is, if you rank the schools by their poverty level, you end up with almost the same rankings as you get when you rank them by their MCAS scores. Well, that's not surprising, because we know that the schools that serve the poorest kids have the greatest needs, the greatest challenges, and that's where the attention is needed. But so far, neither at the state level nor the federal level do we have an answer for that. Right? That is, that nowhere in the talk about standards is there a talk about how do we raise the standard of the quality of education that the kids receive in the schools that we know are struggling the most. Somehow that's not a part of the conversation so far. My colleague, the same one who was the MCAS advocate, he says, well, we keep saying they've got to deal with the opportunity to learn standards. I know that's a good point. And I said, but it's not happening. He said, yeah, I know. It's not happening. It's not a part of the conversation. I am not against testing. I think that the kind of testing we need, though, is diagnostic testing. We need to know a lot more about what kids know, about what they can do, and what they need to know so that we will stop guessing about what to teach them. In a lot of schools, we com it's complete guesswork in what we call instruction. It's not tailored to the learning styles or the learning needs of kids. And consequently, the kids with the greatest needs fall further and further behind. I'm also not against standards and, and having clear benchmarks that children need to meet to order to, to satisfy what we consider uh, uh, basic education in this country. The question is, who should, the, who should feel that accountability? The kids or the adults? I'm for sharing the accountability, but at least let the adults feel some of it, starting with the state legislature. I always thought that if they applied, if they gave the state legislature the MCAS first, that would be the ultimate test. <laughs> the underlying problem here is the issue that Wendy raised, which is that just beneath the surface is a questioning in our society about whether or not all children can learn whether or not it's possible to teach poor kids, particularly poor black and brown kids. Can we even do it? And we know, especially if we've read Nick Lemon's book, that there are a lot of people out there throughout this country, particularly in the past, who don't think it's possible, who think that some people simply can't do it. They don't have the genetic endowments to. And I would argue, and I, whenever I talk to teachers, particularly in schools, and uh, that have low results, and for, particularly for long periods of time, often what I hear about why children don't perform has everything to do with the children and who they are and what's wrong with them and their families and their community and nothing about what we do as educators. And to the degree that we affix all of the blame and responsibility on the children and their families and their communities and accept none of it for ourselves, Nothing will ever change. Now, the fact is that there are other countries that have shown that it's possible to educate poor black and brown kids at high levels. So that's the good news. I spent the last several years doing research in the Caribbean. There are several Caribbean countries that have higher adult literacy rates than the United States. Okay, Barbados, for one. Okay. When I was in Barbados three years ago, the SAT was given to about 300 students who signed up to take the exam. Because increasingly, although Barbados is a former British colony, Barbadian students want to apply to American schools. So the exam was offered through the US Embassy. The average test score for these students was just over 1,200. Now you should note that all of these kids were black, and the vast majority of them were poor. Why is it that being poor and black is not an obstacle to learning at high levels in Barbados. Do they know something we don't know? It's certainly not their high-tech system, right? or all the money they're spending on their schools even. They've got something else going for them. What they have is a culture of high expectations for all kids. Black kids in Barbados don't grow up thinking that all they can become is athletes, and rap stars. 
They would see the prime minister and the judges and the professors and their teachers and know that all of that is possible in Barbados. I could take you to Curaçao. Curaçao is still a Dutch colony. In Curaçao, the average person speaks four languages, Spanish, Dutch, English, and Papamiento. Somehow, being poor and black and living in Curaçao doesn't keep you from learning many languages. We live in a country where several states are, believe English only, English only. We can't do more than that. More than that is beyond us, even though there are lots of examples of countries that have found ways to educate kids in more than one language and think it's a good idea. It's odd that at a time when we're coming close together as a globe that we would advocate English only as a way to teach our kids. So I would say that if we look abroad, if we look at what other countries that have greater success in education are doing, I'd say we could look right to Canada, for example, or we could look further south. Now, I would mention Cuba, but then people say, oh, this guy is <laughs> a real subversive. <laughs> well, they're so subversive down there in Cuba, they believe that although they're a poor country, that all children should have access to preschool. All of them. High-quality preschool. What a radical idea. We've known for the last 30 years that children who have access to Head Start in this country do better in terms of long-term outcomes than kids who don't. We know it. Yet still, there are lots and lots of kids across the country who do not have access to either Head Start or to high-quality early childhood education. The real issue here is not do we know what we're doing? Can we do this? Do we have the technology? The answer to that is yes. We know how to do this. We have examples of schools already that have done this, that are doing it well, even with poor kids. The question is, why aren't we doing it for all of them? And that, I believe, has much more to do with politics than it does with education. That is ultimately the reason why we don't provide all of our children with access to highly competent teachers is simply because we don't value all of our children. We simply don't care enough about them. And as painful as that might seem, especially because it runs against the rhetoric of the day, leave no child behind, which rhetoric I love, the fact of the matter is there's very little evidence that we're going to leave no child behind. I was uh, on a panel recently with uh, Rod Page, the current Secretary of Education, and I asked him whether or not he still believed a letter that he signed. He signed a letter prior to, be, prior to being named Secretary, which was signed by five other superintendents and addressed to the President about what the new Secretary of Education should do. And in it, he spelled out some very basic points about what he felt it would take to provide the conditions in urban school districts to ensure that they had a chance to improve. Well, since being named Secretary of Education, Rod Page says the President's policies are his policies. And so even when we have a person who clearly knows better, because the fact is that Houston was doing some pretty impressive things, because I've spent time there, under his leadership, we still end up with policies which are so narrowly framed and which don't even begin to get at the substance of education, namely the quality of teaching available to kids, even when we have people who know better. So I would argue that a big part of the problem is political. And much of that has to do both with the lack of will to provide children with the education they need and with our tendency to view the remedy through gimmicks. Right? We continue to believe that there's a gimmick that we can use, some trick, some, if we just do this, it'll solve the problem. Right? So before I left California, Jerry Brown had been elected the mayor of, of Oakland. And like most politicians, he said, if you elect me, I will fix your schools. And so Jerry Brown got what he wished, and he became the mayor and his great remedy, he said, I'm going to turn them all into charge.